According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. We are in the midst of Ezekiel 28 once again, so join me there. We're looking at Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. We look at the five I wills from uh, Isaiah as we look at the, uh, the heart of pride from Ezekiel. We have Halel ben Shachar in Ezekiel, and we have Chotham Takanith in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, got those mixed up. Isaiah is the one that has um, the, uh, the Halel ben Shachar. It's Ezekiel that has Chotham Takanith. I almost had those confused. All right, well, let's start with a word of prayer. Ask the Father to bless our time of study. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word and the privilege we have to assemble together. We do ask for your hand and blessing upon our time today that the word of God as it goes forth would not be impaired by any human limitations on the part of the speaker or on the part of the hearers. Father, we thank you that the, uh, the power of your truth shines forth through the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit. We combine spiritual with spiritual, Father, as uh, a spirit-gifted teacher communicates and as spirit-indwelled believers listen. Father, we, uh, we ask that all these things would resound for your glory. We thank you that uh, each and every time we assemble is once again your occasion to manifest your faithfulness. So do so again on this day, Father, and we thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are in the midst of main point D, the fall of Satan. And a lot of this is, uh, is uh, rep repetitive because we've touched upon certain aspects of it under main point C. Under main point C, we're looking at the original stewardship of angels, trying to catch the glimpses of what they did before they fell. We saw that Satan was involved in a priesthood, that he was encrusted with an ephod of gems, as it were, on his being, on his person, that he had sanctuaries, plural, that he defiled in the process of his fall. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's kind of inescapable. I did my best to try to look at the placement and stewardship apart from the details of the fall itself and uh, probably didn't do so well with that as we uh, look ahead and see these details of his fall. But obviously he was in priestly service. Obviously he was involved in a context of worship and in the splendor of that worship is where he goes off track. And that's what we're going to see in this development, main point D. The fall of Satan is the true original sin and introduced evil into the cosmos. We talk about Adam's original sin, uh, which was, of course, second to Eve's original sin. And there's different terms that we have as it relates to original sin. We want to make sure that we're clear on those. Satan's sin did not result in a lost estate. That's critical for us. None of us as human beings have any lingering effects or any integral damage to ourselves by virtue of Satan's original sin. It's a huge difference. Adam's original sin, on the other hand, is what produced for us the positional truth of our lost estate. That's where we have a sin nature from. If you have a human father, you have a sin nature from that human father. We have the positional estate of sin. We have the imputed sin that we have in Adam, whereby we need to have the imputed righteousness in Christ. Okay? All of those are wonderful positional truths. I hope we're clear on them. We should be very solid on them. Um, but understand that none of that relates to Satan and his original sin. The angelic realm of creation was not a federal uh, headship type of creation. They weren't uh, linear in their descent. They weren't procreative in their design, all right? Um, unlike the realm of humanity. So these are important differences. What does come about, though, is a sphere of evil. What comes about is a systematized rebellion against the rule of God the Father that is called in the Bible evil. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the tree that Adam and Eve were forbidden from partaking of. Evil preceded Adam and Eve, as Satan's fall preceded Adam and Eve. We want to be very clear on that as well. I think... Um, some of the folks that, uh, that we appreciate for their work in creation science, we also have to be careful with because they don't do well in terms of their angelology. And they don't do well in the fall of Satan. They don't do well with the angelic conflict at large. 
And so they, they really don't do well when they talk about the tohu wabohu of Genesis 1-2 and how it is that the earth was judged by God and then restored to, to habitable conditions for the creation of humanity. And that uh, will be a big part of what we look at in the aftermath of Main Point D when we see the conclusion to this fall. For now, though, we're dealing with the lament and the taunt. The lament is Ezekiel 28. The taunt is Isaiah 14. It's just a different genre of literature. It's a different um, approach to the communication. Remember, a lament is something that has a sense of uh, sadness, uh, sorrow, because it didn't need to be. And that's what happens here. God's lament over the fall of Satan, uh, as opposed to Isaiah 14, which is not a lament. Isaiah 14 is a taunt. And it's a taunt that's going to be it's drafted ahead of time, but it's going to be sung in that day. And we'll highlight that for you when we get to the details of Isaiah 14. Needless to say, if you misteach it, it's a problem. If you fail to identify a lament for what it is, you're going to have misapplication of your doctrine. If you fail to understand a proverb for what it is, you're going to have a misapplication of the doctrine. And how many believers uh, are all... Um, misapplied in what they're looking at because they're looking at proverbs and they're calling them doctrines. They're looking at promises and they're calling them principles. And they're getting confused between the application of the different types of scripture that we have. So let's try to keep each of these straight. And we start with the lament. Yahweh lamented the fall of Chothain Takanith in which his original sin was demonstrated through three pairings. As we look at this original sin, when we get to Isaiah, we'll have five I wills. But when we stay here in Ezekiel, we have three pairings of cause and effect. And here's our first one. We have the internal mental attitude violence. The internal mental attitude violence. That's the cause. The effect uh, motivated this first sin in the universe. Let's look at it. The internal mental attitude violence. And what was it that sparked it? What was it that motivated that? You'll notice here in Ezekiel 28, verse 16, by the abundance of your trade, you are internally filled with violence and you sinned. All right, cause and effect. Internal violence, sin. All right, at a certain point, he crosses the line from thinking about it to actually the commission of the sin. And there it is, internally filled with violence and you sin. What was the tipping point? <laughs> you know, what was the, uh, at what point do you cross the line? And sometimes we, we play with fire, do we not? Where at what point have I thought about it to the point now that I've crossed that line and now I'm involved in the mental attitude sin, even before I accomplish the overt activity or the verbal activity, the mental attitude sin precedes both of those. All right. Now, I believe that the consideration is not a sin. That part of temptation is you have to identify what the temptation is and then you have to place it in the perspective and identify that uh, and you want it to be sooner rather than later. You want to identify that that's a temptation and I want no part of that. When, when, when the devil tempted the Lord, he thought about it. All right. But he immediately rejected it and said, no, that's not scripture. That's not pleasing to the father. OK. At what point have we crossed the line from thinking about it to wanting to do it? At which point now, uh, maybe we haven't yet decided to do it, but we want to, okay? And in which of those layers have we crossed the line into mental added carnality? At which of those points are we no longer walking by means of the Holy Spirit? Because we have to quench the Holy Spirit to start considering, hmm, could I do that? Could I get away with that? All right? And at that point, I'm no longer walking by means of the Spirit. And in any event, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully try to pinpoint more of those. To me, this is the huge application for us. It's, it's far more significant. The fall of Satan is interesting, certainly, but the, the real practical matter of it, how it applies to me day by day, is to watch his fall and realize those are the snares I can fall into. The snares of the devil that pastors are warned about. The issues of pride that every believer is warned about. The problem when we don't operate according to God's wisdom when we turn to the world's wisdom. Those are the applications we have to be concerned about. All the nitty gritty and the details of what happened on the angelic earth to Chotham Takanith, they are interesting, all right? But let's, we gotta get past the curiosity factor to understand where it is that it reaches us in our Christian walk. So we have the Hamas violence, the internal mental attitude of violence. And he was filled with this violence, filled with this thought 
The idea is, Jesus said, that when you have anger in your heart and you say to your brother, Raka, you've already committed the sin. Whether you've committed the murder or not, when you have anger towards your, your brother, that's murder. Right? When you look at a woman with lust, that's adultery. Before you even do the overt deed, it starts in the mind. It starts with the mental attitude sin. And this is what starts happening. Now, to me, this is far more fascinating to study than Adam and Eve and their sin because they had a tempter. They had a serpent that was telling them lies and was offering them uh, the tantalizing uh, uh, untruths of what they thought might happen. Okay, at least in Eve's case, she thought what might happen when she ate the fruit. We know she was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He knew better, but he rebelled anyway. Okay? But for Satan and his fall, to be internally filled with violence, what gives him these ideas? Where had he ever seen these ideas? How does the, even the concept of using might to uh, impose your will, how does that thought come to him? At what point is there an attitude that's being shaped by uh, independent thinking apart from what God himself is revealing? All right. And once he starts walking down that road, he starts to realize how beautiful he is, how powerful he is, what it is that he might accomplish. Okay. Um, we start to see this filling takes place. Okay. Secondly, now, our second pairing, the fixation on personal beauty. Fixation on personal beauty. If you were here Wednesday night, I told all the ugly people to stay home. So I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you got the memo. We only have the beautiful people here this morning. Thank you. Fixation, <laughs> fixation on personal beauty. Here's another cause and effect. All right. Fixation on personal beauty produced a prideful heart. And that's the first part here, verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, because of your beauty, cause and effect, fixation on personal beauty. Now, here's the other thing. We, we ask, how does uh, the idea of violence come into his mind? Where does the standard of beauty come to his mind? He is the most beautiful of all the created creatures. But at what point is the uh, perspective on beauty perverted to the point of pride, to the point of sin, okay? Because he was clearly there, where it lifted up the heart. Now, does this have to happen in every case? Does every beautiful person have to uh, make that the trigger for their, for their pride? Of course not, all right? And it, I think it is significant that it was not his wisdom that sparked his pride. It was his beauty that sparked his pride and then corrupted his wisdom. Do you see the order on that? It could have been his wisdom that sparked his pride, and that might have then corrupted his beauty. But no, it went the other way. It was the beauty that sparked his pride and then resulted in the corruption of his wisdom. That's the second clause out of verse 17. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. And when we study splendor, I think we'll have a good clue as to uh, what happens when, when beauty is, uh, is abused. The verb gaba is a, is a wonderful word study for us. And we'll take some time this morning to take a look at these verses. Gaba, G-A-B-A-H, uh, number 1361. It's got 34 uses as a verb, uh, to be high, to be exalted. And there's proper things that should be exalted. Uh, we should lift up our eyes in worship. We should lift up our voices in song. We should lift up our hands and so forth. But we should not lift up ourselves. <laughs> we, should, we should lift up the Lord. He is the one that is worthy to be lifted up. And when somebody other than the Lord is lifted up, then uh, we have an inappropriate idolatry, something that is taking the place of the one who is worthy of being lifted up. Um, and so as we look at each one of these verses, hopefully uh, these are the things we'll have in our thinking as we, as we proceed. But before we even any of that, just one introductory thought. If, if you are beautiful, um, I'm not talking about physically, externally uh, attractive. Uh, if you are personally beautiful, who, who, who gets the credit for that? <laughs> who did that? You know, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not, you know, receive it? If you are, if, if, if you were born beautiful, like you didn't birth yourself, <laughs> all right? Uh, you, you know, you maybe had some nice, you know, genetic contributions from some attractive parents, but whatever was the case, okay, at what point does a beautiful person start to take credit 
for their appearance, to take credit for their beauty. See? Now I'm just talking about external beauty, not soul beauty or inner beauty or true legitimate beauty and so forth. You're, you're, you're too far ahead of me at this point. Slow down. <laughs> okay? You know I'm going to go there later. But for now, let's just keep it superficial and in, in, in surface. All right? Who gets credit for that? And how do you claim credit for that? And to a large extent, that second beauty you want me to go to is, is, is of the sort that when you develop that true beauty of godliness and modesty and character and so forth, then the, the production of that beauty is its own defense. It's its own humility and its own provision for, for not being prideful. The prideful heart hinders that true beauty from taking place. You understand what I'm saying? But back to the superficial and the fixation on the beautiful. Um, you know, yes, he's beauty. Uh, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. So just take, take that down and ask yourself this question. Physical beauty, personal appearance, exterior beauty, what should that be causative of? <laughs> yeah, just, just put it in any application. For Satan, for you, for any human being, for Jesus, for anybody. If there is a physical attractiveness, if there is an external beauty... Just, just ask yourself now, that should cause what? What should that cause? Is it, is it designed to be causative? Is it designed to produce something? And if so, what? Or maybe nothing. Maybe it shouldn't produce a single thing. But if it does, what might it be? Okay. And uh, I guess Wednesday night, I'll return to that thought for our question and answer time. We'll see if there's any answers. I got some ideas, but we'll see if you have any ideas in, uh, in the meantime. All right, let's go to 2 Chronicles 26. Start to take a look at our Gabah applications. There's only 34 in the Old Testament, so what you see on the screen is the bulk of them, if not all of them. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. And let's see what it is that should be lifted up, shall we? 2 Chronicles 26, 16. And what happens when hearts get lifted up inappropriately? We see this is the pride that's, un, that's Uzziah's undoing. There's our little paragraph blurb in the New American Standard. Verse 16 says, When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. This is a fascinating verse because it parallels so much of what we're looking at with Satan in, in Ezekiel. We've got pride, we've got beauty, we've got corruption, we've got abandonment of the Lord. We have a departure from your design office to intrude in some other office. Uzziah was not content to be the king of Israel, the son of David, to be, or the king of Judah, son of David, seated on the throne there in Jerusalem. He wants to now intrude into the priesthood. That wasn't his realm. Likewise, Satan the highest of the created beings, the most beautiful of all the created beings, the high priest of the angelic stewardship. And now he wants to rule with executive authority on a throne. Kind of the reverse order from Uzziah. Uzziah had kingship, but he wanted priesthood. Satan had priesthood, and it's debatable whether he had kingship or not. We'll discuss that when we talk about his throne in Isaiah 14. We have the corruption that happens here. He acted corruptly. We saw corruption with Satan, how he corrupted his wisdom. Unfaithful to the Lord his God. The, the pure essence of what we have with Satan, he was the guardian chair. But instead of guarding, he was magnifying himself. Unfaithful. And so uh, the example there. All right, uh, over to Psalms, Psalms 103. Next use of Gabah. And, and these ought to be familiar verses to you. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's Gabah. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. You're familiar with these verses? So yes, it's lifted up, but it's lifted up how high? How so high you can't even measure it? How do you, you, know, how do you measure the heavens above the earth? How do you measure God's ways above our ways? It's immeasurable. So too is the immeasurable pride of insanity when the Satan starts to lift himself up. How do you measure that? I find that to be interesting. Okay, all right, Psalm 131. Psalm 131, our next use of Gabah. 
O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters, that is, things lifted high, or in things too difficult for me. See, understand the things of the Lord are indeed lifted high. And we have, we have to just have to be humble before him as we walk before him. Wonderful attitude here in this Davidic psalm. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. What an image. I think it's a beautiful metaphor. It keeps us from getting too full of ourselves in uh, lifting up our eyes, involving ourselves in these great matters, things too difficult for me. Okay? You know, you think about these false ambitions that come along, that heart of pride. This is why time and time and time again it's, it's pounded into the pastors in 1 Timothy. Watch out for pride. Watch out for pride. Don't, don't ordain a man too young. He'll be lifted up in pride. He'll fall into the condemnation of the devil. If he's going to lift up his eyes to things that are too mighty for him, that's trouble. All right. So there's the application there. How about Proverbs 18 too? Proverbs 18. Many of these ought to be familiar. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. We have a similar warning in the New Testament. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Right? Pride goes before the fall. If you're haughty, if you're lifted up, if you're full of yourself, it's the same warning that we have in Romans. Don't to overthink. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think so as to have sound judgment. All right? Because all of these, these aren't just simply helpful hints. These aren't tips. These aren't good ideas for, for a smart way to conduct yourself. They are vitally essential in the Christian walk because they are the essence of our adversary in his original fall. And they're what he sparks within us every time he wants to trip us up. That's what, it's not an accident. The very systems of pride that are voiced in the I wills are then repeated in the temptations of Satan, of Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay? Not an accident at all. So verse 12, and I'm virtually certain that's the Gaba application there. I'll double check that before Wednesday night. Isaiah 7.11. Isaiah 7, verse 11. More Gabbah. Look at all these in Isaiah. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 52, twice in Isaiah 55. Here's a, a particular author who's fond of this particular term. Isaiah chapter 7. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or Gabbah as heaven, or as high as heaven. Make it as deep as shale or as Nabah as heaven, as high as heaven. We're familiar with this because he was trying to act all uh, uh, holy at this point. Oh, no, no, I would never put the Lord my God to the test. Well, that's what you're doing. He just told you. <laughs> he just told you to name your sign and you're not even willing to obey the Lord? Okay. He says, the Lord himself will give you a sign then. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And... Uh, goes on in the context here of Isaiah 7. Isaiah 52. This is one of those where you want to slap back and hit somebody upside the head and say, come on. He said, make it as high as heaven. You could ask for anything here. You know. Clearly he didn't have the discernment Solomon had to ask for some wisdom. And be praised for that. All right, Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Now, why will he? See, what we have here is a description of Jesus Christ. What we have here is a description of eternal blessing. But we also see this is what Satan was lust lusting after. So what entitles Jesus to this and what does not entitle Satan to this? And how is it that Jesus is entitled to this because he humbled himself first? I'm giving it all away. <laughs> and it's not to be taken. It's not to be claimed for yourself. You don't have to look at something and say, oh, I deserve that and more than that, and then promote yourself. Jesus didn't do that. Remember, before he was exalted above all things, he first humbled himself. That's the key. But here we have the, uh, the promise. This is what Jesus can look forward to. 
Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. You know what he had to suffer? You know what he had to go through first in being humbled before he could be exalted? That's the order. That's the order. Or Satan has no interest in the suffering. He just wants to be exalted. Over to 55, verse 9. Twice in verse 9. We're familiar with these terms as well. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, gaba, than your ways, and my thoughts, than your thoughts. All right? Familiar with all of those. Ezekiel is our passage. Notice, though, it's not just verse 17. It's not just verse 17. Before this was uh, in, in, the, in the chapter, before we have the description of Satan, we have the description of the king of Tyre, the ruler of Tyre, the human being that's under satanic influence in his day and age. And his activity, to chip off of the old block, it is very representative of what Satan's activity was that, that sparked Satan's fall. And these similarities are, are not coincidental, they're not accidental. I haven't read through these verses. Um, this uh, this fellow, Ethbaal, I think his name was, the third um, he was, uh, you know, a pagan king to the core. In large extent, I think to large extent, Tyre and Sidon still existed because there was lingering blessing by association going back to King Hiram when Hiram was a friend of David, when Hiram provided for Solomon and provided blessings for the building of the temple. I believe the Phoenician trading centers reaped that blessing for centuries afterwards, even when they were into the, the idolatry and darkness that produced Jezebel. Uh, there was still a lingering benefit to, uh, to Tyre. And this guy was a piece of work. I'm pretty sure his name was Eth, Eth Baal. Um, pretty sure. What do you get when you cross Ethel with Baal? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, that was mean. No, I'm sorry. Eth Baal, the third. This guy's name. <laughs> we'll save that for the fellowship time. <laughs> All right, but here's this uh, ruler. Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up. Okay, it's the same vocabulary we have for Satan. Your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God, although you make your heart like the heart of God. All right, this is his idolatry. This is his self-idolatry, his uh, magnification of self. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. You know, the clever that thinks they're cleverer than they are. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself. Well, isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that what the devil was doing? And becoming so fabulously wealthy and all impressed with how clever he was to figure out how to do that and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. It's almost identical to what we see in Satan and his fall. It's just being played out now in the human being that's ruling this, this trading empire. You know, the same thing happened with, the, uh, with Venice and the, the Venetian city-states in the Middle Ages. Same thing happened with, with England and her global uh, sea trade and the the, uh, the wealth that was amassed there. Uh, here we are in our global trade, sitting on two oceans and trading around the world, and we think we're untouchable. We think we're the world's last remaining superpower. Who can touch us? Say, well, some <laughs> seventh century Arabs with box cutters touched us, didn't they, in uh, 2001? All right. Uh, these verses, uh, verse... 2 and verse 5 are where we have the uh, Gaba. Your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you. Now, that, you understand, that's a rebuke. Making your heart like the heart of God. You can misread that and think, well, that's not so bad. What's wrong with that? Don't I want to have the heart of God? Don't I want to have the mind of Christ? And see, as he molds you and shapes you, yes. He does that, not you making yourself that. You don't want to be a self-made God. 
All right? That's uh, only God is the only self-existent, uncaused, eternal I am. For you to, to make yourself what you think is the pinnacle is, uh, is the arrogance that's being communicated here. All right. And then verse 17 is our verse dealing with Chotheim uh, Takanith. Finally, Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 11. In that day you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud exulting ones. Your proud exulting ones. The, the heart lifter uppers. Okay? Uh, and you will never again be haughty lifted up on my holy mountain. There's a day coming. It's going to be the day of our Christ, our Savior's exaltation. Not ours. Not ours. Okay? Great chapter. I love this chapter. Looking for the future of Israel. All right, now here's the third cause and effect. Splendor. Splendor is what corrupted Satan's wisdom. You got cause and effect. Splendor, corrupting wisdom. And what is splendor? Here's a short definition for you. Splendor is shining beauty rather than reflective beauty. Splendor is shining beauty rather than reflective beauty. It's a distinction that's to be found. In other words, it's not reflecting somebody else's light. It's actually producing your own light or what you call light, producing your own source of what you want other people to be illumined by. So it's shining rather than reflective. It's uh, yif'ah, yif'ah in the Hebrew. Y-I-P-H apostrophe A-H. It's only two uses in the right here in uh, Ezekiel. But the verb, yafat, has eight uses. Uh, the uh, idea being to shine forth. To shine forth. Not to reflect, but to produce its own shining existence. Deuteronomy 33, 2. Psalm 50 in verse 2. Psalm 80 in verse 1. Psalm 94 in verse 1. So the verb is yafat. Y-A-F-A apostrophe. The ayin apostrophe that angles to the left. Yafat, number 33, 1-3. All right? And here, back to Ezekiel, we see it in verse uh, 17. We also have it in verse 7. The second one applies to Satan. The first one applies to Ethbaal. Um, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations. They will draw their swords against the beauty of uh, uh, of your wisdom and defile your splendor. There's our term, splendor. Beauty and splendor. Beauty grows into splendor when you get full of it. <laughs> when you get absolutely consumed, preoccupied with your own beauty uh, and the desire to make it more is uh, what happens when beauty becomes splendor. And we have the, the combination there in verse 7. First beauty, then splendor. Same thing happens with Satan in uh, verse 17. You've got beauty, you've got splendor. Heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Okay? Now, is there anything wrong with decorations? <laughs> anything wrong with a brave, you know, with makeup and jewelry, and nice clothes, attractiveness? Obviously not. Okay? There's nothing in the modesty verses of the New Testament that are hostile to any of that. But it says, let not your adornment be merely the external, the braiding of the hair, the wearing of dresses, and, and all the rest. Not merely the external. You want the soul beauty as well as the attractive, tasteful, modest adornments that, uh, that us men always appreciate <laughs> for the attractive women to participate in. Okay, So it's not a criticism of that. But what happens, though, when it becomes splendor? What happens when it is overboard when it's done in a immodest way when the desire is to not simply reflect God's beauty but to then simply accentuate improperly uh, when you are promoting self instead of reflecting God okay that's the immodest approach and uh, we've got a whole culture right now that I think needs uh, needs remedial lessons on modesty <laughs> and I don't know who's going to teach that class all right, because they're not getting it in school, and they're certainly not getting it in college. They're not getting it in their homes. 
I imagine there's a few dinosaur remnant local church out there that still teach modesty on a biblical basis. All right? In any event. And, and as bad as things are here, it's even worse in Europe. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? And Bob will tell you, and Jim Myers will tell you, and uh, it's just stunning. And I even made Jim Myers laugh. I, I said, how do the... <laughs> I asked him, I said, how do the real prostitutes stand out? I mean, how do they market themselves? How do they let themselves, I mean, how do they let their customers know who they are? Because you can't tell any difference between normal girls and, and, and the working girls. And then it's just, and, and Jim just started laughing. It was the funniest thing he'd heard. But, you know, it's funny, funny sad is what it is. Funny sad. Anyway. Let's look at the verbs here for shining forth. And I think you'll notice the difference. I don't want to, anything we do, okay? Anything we do. And, and more than just beauty, too. Let's try to expand beyond beauty to wisdom to everything. That we are vessels of grace, all right? We are vessels of grace. We want to be reflective of what God has blessed us. So if God has loved us and we love others, it's a reflection of God's love. If we have wisdom and we teach others wisdom, it's a reflection of God's wisdom. If we have God's beauty and we reflect God's beauty, that's what it is, a reflection of God's beauty. In none of these cases, from wisdom to grace to knowledge to beauty to anything, are we striving to produce our own that we then can claim credit for and impress others with, look what we've done. Look how smart I am. Look how wise I am. Look how beautiful I am. Look what I've produced. Everything I am, from grace to love to righteousness to knowledge to wisdom to beauty, everything, is a reflection of God at work in me. And I hope we're going to be clear on that. All right, so Deuteronomy 33, 2. Let's look at these uses of shine forth. Now, I've only given you four out of the eight, but I think these are the four that tell it the best as it relates to the splendor of Satan in his fall. Deuteronomy 33, 2. This is the blessing with which Moses, the, son of, uh, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth. Here's our verb. He shone forth from Mount Paran. All right. Now, God has every entitlement to shine forth because that's who he is. He has every entitlement to shine forth. God is light. God is the one that shines. When Satan starts to claim this, when Satan starts to produce his own shining forth instead of reflecting God's shining forth, that's a problem. All right, so he shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand, and they follow in your steps. And so it goes on, but this is the point. It's Yahweh himself who shines forth, and he's entitled to shine forth. That's who he is, all right? If we are children of light, why is that? It's because we're sons of God, and God is light, Okay? And our light is a reflection of his light. Has to be. If we try to produce our own, if we try to impress people with our own goodness, we're back to the filthy rags we had before we got saved. We want to be reflections, not, not uh, shining forth. Uh, Psalm, the rest of these are poetic. Look at this. And that was poetic. Deuteronomy 33 was poetic. But Psalm 50 Psalm 50. I'll back up to verse 1. It's a psalm of Asaph. The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. All right, now you understand the totality was described here from the rising of the sun to its setting. We've got imagery here that speaks of everywhere, okay? From where it rises to where it sets, and obviously that's everywhere, from as far as the east is from the west and, and so forth. So everywhere the sun rises, everywhere the sun sets. Uh, but the sun is not, the, is not what's shining forth. That illuminating ball of gas in our solar system is not what is the real brightness this psalm is celebrating. The psalm is celebrating God and what he shines forth. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. And the more I ponder this verse, I start to realize what a lament it was for 
uh, for Satan. What a lament it was for the one that was perfect in beauty, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But instead of testifying to Yahweh and his shining forth, Satan decided to do a little shining forth of his own. Decided to, to transform his beauty into splendor. And he's not entitled to splendor. Splendor is the Lord's. All right. Uh, Psalm 80. Psalm 80. Oh, give ear. Another Psalm of Asaph. I look forward to meeting this Asaph guy. Oh, give, he has such amazing hymns and so many different, many of them in angelic realms. O oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Who is it that's enthroned? Who's supposed to shine forth? What happens when this rebellious cherubim who's supposed to be covering decides that he himself is going to shine forth? Is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. It's the violation of his original design. We took the time to spotlight the <clears throat> guardian cherub who covers, who overshadows, who guards. And so, <clears throat> to me, there it is. One is supposed to be overshadowing the other, but the other is the celebrity. It's his delight to shine forth. Finally, Psalm 94, 1. Psalm 94, 1. O oh, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. <laughs> There's more things that only he's entitled to. Okay? Who all is entitled to take their own vengeance? Or not. Not at all. There are some applications that are left for him and for him alone. He's the only one with the perfect character and integrity who can execute vengeance without compromising himself into some mental attitude of sin like we do. All right? We don't take our own vengeance. We make room for the wrath of God. O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render recompense to the proud. How long shall the wicked, O Lord, how long shall the wicked exalt? You know, it's remarkable. This says, I think it's a rebuke on human wickedness, but we could view it in, in satanic terms as well, related to his pride, related to his exaltation. But it's the God of vengeance who's going to shine forth. Not, uh, not Satan. All right, so there they are. The fall of Satan is the true original sin, introduced evil into the cosmos, and we have these three cause and effect uh, descriptions of his fall. When we turn to Isaiah 14, we have the verbalization spelled out for us, where he says in his heart, we've now seen what happened, now we're going to ask, have a glimpse into his thinking as it happened. What it was that he had in mind. What it was he thought he was going to achieve in the manifestation of splendor, in the accumulation of wealth, in the uh, gathering of allies. Okay? And we go from the lament to the taunt. So point two now. Yahweh taunted the fallen star. When the five I wills of Halel ben Shachar demonstrated to be empty boasts, Yahweh taunted the fallen star. When the five I wills of Halel ben Shachar are demonstrated to be empty boasts. He was 0 for 5. That's a terrible batting average, you know? 0 for 5. He said, I will, I will, I will. All right? I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will take my seat on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will rise above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Five high wills. You want to know the, uh, the best method for scripture memory? <laughs> About 3,000 hours of study. <laughs> you know, I just pour over the verses again and again and again and again and again. I don't think I will ever forget these five high wills. Just you spend hours and hours in those verses. But all these five I wills, understand, voicing them. Now, admittedly, it says, you said in your heart. You said in your heart. So maybe he didn't verbalize it. Maybe he didn't utter them in, in audible fashion for fellow angels to listen to. 
But God heard it. God heard it loud and clear. And this was his thinking. This was his purpose. These were his goals and objectives. Okay? These five I wills. Take me the language of I will. Who's entitled to that? See? In my book, only the I am can make I will covenant declarations. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Okay? The language of I will is the covenant language that only the I am is entitled to utter. He's the one that knows the end from the beginning. He's the one with the perfection to make good on what he's promised. Satan's just a liar. And even if he believed it up front, I suspect he did. With the corrupted wisdom, I think he's insane. The definition of insane. We throw insane around a lot, but this is insane. Out of his angelic mind. He is, even voicing, I will be like the Most High God, is insane. To try to be like the unique by definition, can't happen. If something is one of a kind, there's nothing else like it, nor can there be. But he's going to make himself that way. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to be the uncaused cause of all, as God is. But he doesn't have a cause. He didn't make himself the I am. He is the I am, always has been, always will be. The idea that Satan could make himself destroys the rest of the sentence. All right. Now this is a taunt. And as we work our way through it, we're going to see. Now, we're going to pinpoint on 13 and 14 because that's where the five I wills are. But there's a larger context for it. And the larger context is where we start to catch the glimpses and details of that particular fall. So yes, we'll highlight the I will, I will, I will. There's five of them there. We have the title in verse 12 of Hillel ben Shachar. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. But now notice, you have been cut down to the earth. That's in agreement with what God said in Ezekiel was the judgment. I have cast you before kings, that he is not in the lake of fire yet. The fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels, but first he has to be cast down to the earth. He has to be on display. You have weakened the nations. Let me back up even earlier than that. You'll notice, I think in verses 1 through 3, have a context as it relates to Israel, and then a transition, a prophetic shift, as it were. I like to use that expression. Um, That you will uh, take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Now that's in in this day. Notice, when is this taunt going to take place? Verse 3, will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved. So when is that going to be? When can they take up this taunt? When will they be invited to sing this taunt? Okay? Now, when Isaiah wrote this, they had not gone to their Babylonian captivity yet. In fact, Babylon was not even yet dominant. Assyria was the dominant power. Assyria was the one that Jehoshaphat was afraid of, or Hezekiah was afraid of. Isaiah had to come alongside Hezekiah and encourage him that the Assyrians weren't going to destroy Jerusalem. It was going to be Babylon. After Babylon overthrows Assyria, that Babylon would be the instrument of their captivity. But here we have a taunt on Babylon. Likewise, in chapter 13, there's a a destruction of Babylon there. And I think we've got to be careful with these eschatological Babylons that don't relate to the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar's day. All right. Let's, let's get the whole chapter. Look at verse 1. When Yahweh will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take them along and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord, as male servants and female servants. And they will take their captors captive and will rule over their oppressors. This has not yet happened, folks. This is the second advent of Jesus Christ. This is the millennial kingdom of of Israel. All right? There will come a day when in the millennial kingdom, Gentiles will decide, you know what? Instead of living in our Gentile land under a Gentile king, it will actually be preferable to get a position in Israel. And it means servanthood. It means being a male servant or a female servant. 
But if I attach myself to Israel, I get to live in the land, I get to be a blessing to the Jewish people, and I get to be blessed by the Jewish people. And so rather than identify with Gentiles for the Millennial Kingdom, they become volitional bond servants in the Millennial Kingdom. And uh, we've got other passages that speak of this as well. All right. And so it will be in the, uh, that day, in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil of her service, which you have been enslaved, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. This will be their song after Armageddon. This will be their song after the uh, return of Jesus Christ, his second advent. They'll get to sing this song as Satan is bound by chains and cast into the abyss for the thousand years. How the oppressor has ceased. How fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. Now, because we know it's the second advent, looking back, this could have application to Gentile nations, certainly. But consider, what if it also applies before Adam? What if it also applies before humanity? There are these five I wills were uttered before Adam. He is already a fallen creature when he's a serpent in Genesis chapter 3. So we have to evaluate these passages and ask ourselves, and it's not... Maybe it's cut and dry. It's not as simple as it might appear. These references to the nations, do they have to be human nations? Could they be, as we've seen in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and other places, could they be angelic nations? So we'll take a look at it. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. See, it's a global phenomenon when Satan is bound. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes against us. Now there's metaphor in this, so we'll um, have to take time to, to consider each, each of these aspects. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when it comes. <laughs> what kind of welcome do you get when you walk in the door? Okay. It's kind of interesting, and particularly in a jail setting. <laughs> Some, some inmates arrive and it's, it's like a family reunion, you know? It's like, uh, hey, you know? And, and they have, you know, from the last five times they were in jail. Some of these characters are very well known. Well, here's somebody excited from beneath because it's the first time you've ever made it and you said you weren't going to, <laughs> right? But here you are. It arouses for you the Rephaim, the spirits of the dead, which we've studied, or the, the uh, Nephilim without their bodies. We've studied that these were the mighty men of old. These were the, the, the giants before the flood, the shades or the departed spirits, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. Every tyrant that you manipulated through human history, every, including that Ethbaal guy, including Alexander the Great, including all these tyrants that have... Uh, receive their thrones because of satanic promotion. You're going to get a standing ovation. These guys uh, are going to be here to welcome you. They will all respond and say to you, even you have been made weak as we. You have become like us. Now remember, part of the judgment is you will die like men. You will die like men. We saw that with the divine counsel passage in Psalm 82, Remember? It can't be a human being that's told he's going to die like men. That doesn't make any sense. You don't tell a human being he's going to die like a human being. But it is judgment upon an angel when you tell an angel you will die like men. You have become like us. What an insult to the one who said, I will be like the Most High God. <laughs> you have become like us. You realize how biting that is? That's why this is a taunt the way that it is, it takes his own words and shows the reality, the polar opposite of what it was he wanted to do. He wanted to exalt himself. What does the scripture say? Those who exalt themselves will be brought low. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. The entire outworking of the Christian way of life is defined here by this aspect of the angelic conflict. Isn't this wonderful? You see how this fits together? All right. This is not just, uh, you know, we don't preach an artificial humility just because it's a helpful hint or it's a tip or it's a, it's a, it's a self-help thing. It makes you a better person in your community. 
No, humility is the essence of the imitation of Christ. It's the ultimate recipe for the pleasure of God the Father. It's the, the best prophylactic defense against the, the pride of the adversary. The genuine humility by being shaped after the, the image of Jesus Christ. Your pomp and the music of your harps have brought you down to shale. Your pomp. That's why I don't like pomp. You know? If you have any pomp, get rid of it. You know? <laughs> Sell it in a garage sale or just donate it somewhere. We don't, we don't need pomp. <laughs> the music of your harps. Nothing wrong with a good music program. I like music. Okay? Well, let's not get carried away with it. Let's not, get, uh, let's not get too wild with it. We want our worship to be a reflection of truth. And not where it's center stage and everything's all about the music and then you get about a five minute sermonette for Christianettes kind of a thing. And then, um, yeah. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you and worms are your covering. How you have fallen from heaven. How you have fallen. That he said he was going to ascend. Everything in his five eye wills is upward in its orientation. Self-promotion, self-exaltation. And yet he is a fallen one. How you have fallen. O star of the morning, son of the dawn. Hillel ben Shachar. And what is it about the morning star anyway? It's a, it's a beautiful title. The imagery is ideal. Because the morning star is so um, fleeting. It, it's, it's there, and it's the brightest one when it's there, but then it's gone. And the light of day comes when the day, you know, when the light of day, the day star, the sun rises. In the, in the full light of day, you can't see Venus anymore, okay? As a rule, typically, is how it works. And this was, this was unacceptable for Satan. You know, you mean my time's coming to an end? This is only temporary? This is leading to something else? You mean angels are designed to render service to those cockroaches you call man? That's unacceptable. Part of what we have to identify is not only what he was trying to achieve in his fall, but what was it he was resisting? What was it he did not want to see happen? What was it they were told was coming next? Okay? And what they were told was coming next was us, man. Proverbs 8, he had his delight in the sons of man. Ezekiel 28 was all about the, the celebration of man. And the angels didn't like that. Is this what's coming next? No. Okay? Remember, all of our life is per preparation for the next. Same thing for them. All of their angel life was preparation for the next. We lose sight of that because we're the next. <laughs> okay? But they had a finite life. It is given to man once to die, and then comes the judgment. Likewise, angelity in their stewardship was preparing for what's next. And what's next is us. And Satan and one third of them said, oh, we don't like what's next. And they tried to create their own what's next for themselves. We'll have more to say on that as we move forward. Goodness, I'm out of time. So, I will, number one, comes up Wednesday night. I will ascend to heaven. It's not Gaba, it's Gala. And we'll talk about Gala Sunday night, or Wednesday evening. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness. Teach us, Father, to not exalt ourselves, but to humble ourselves. And I thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.